烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，早安，铃。Namaste. Well, this is a video that I never anticipated having to make or being able to make. And this is a video where I get to say that I have realized the purport, the actual meaning of the Mahashodashi mantra. And that now I feel qualified to call myself a guru and to invite people to become disciples. Now, what does that all mean? I'm going to spend the rest of this video explaining. Mahashodashi mantra is the 16 syllables. Shodashi means having 16 syllables. Shodashi Mantra is an extension of the Panchadashi Mantra, which is the, the most secret mantra of the Kaula path, the Sri Vidya, the Tantric path to enlightenment. Now, as we've discussed on this channel many, many times, to attain full enlightenment, all the chakras have to be completely open and balanced from the sex chakra all the way to the sahasrara. So in this path, there are no rules and regulations. There are no regulative principles. You do whatever you have to do to accomplish the yogic objective of opening the chakras, aligning and balancing them in the three spinal paths, the kula. Huh? Those three paths are the ida, the pingala, and the sushumna. We've discussed all this many, many times, and we're going to discuss it again on this channel. But when those channels, or when those uh, chakras are all open and the grantis or the knots that block them have been completely penetrated and dissolved then something happens that cannot happen otherwise and that is full self-realization full realization of Brahman now the reason I'm saying all this is to lead up to an announcement that the night before last, I realized this Sodashi Mantra. I broke through the final knot, the Granti, Rudra Granti. Now, Rudra Granti is very, very subtle. And when one penetrates it, one realizes Brahman one realizes that one has always been Brahman and is and always will be nothing but Brahman. And then everything makes sense. Not only is it completely ecstatic and wonderful, but it clears all the doubts from one's mind. I don't think there's anybody even the people who make a lot of money teaching Advaita, so-called Advaita, have certain doubts. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't have certain doubts about, is this really correct? Is this really possible? Could I actually be Brahman? Yeah, is this real? Is it just imagination? Is it just a nice idea? See, but when one actually realizes Brahman, 
all those doubts disappear. Even doubts you didn't know you had. So next thing I want to talk about is being guru. There are many different styles and ways of being guru. You have, first of all, the official gurus, huh? the leaders of big religious or spiritual organizations. And we find that most of these gurus, and you can tell by analyzing their explanations of the scriptures and so on, most of them are on the psychological platform. Why do I say that? Because to lead a big organization, you have to be very knowledgeable and skilled in human psychology. So, for example, Osho, or Sadhguru, or Prabhupada, uh, very, very skilled in leadership. Of course, they have very different styles, huh? like Osho Rajneesh. He he liked to befuddle people and confuse people, you know? And he would say things like, the words that I say aren't the real meaning. The real meaning is in the silence. <laughs> well, that's a good way to buy yourself time to think of what to say. <laughs> but I told you, he's expert. He also said things like, when I'm serious, you can be sure that I'm joking. And when I'm joking, you can be absolutely certain that I'm serious. <laughs> now, there is some pretext for this in the Zen tradition, the giving koans and other non-logical um, objects of contemplation. But those are given in an intimate one-to-one -one Guru disciple relationship. And the, the form and style of the koan was adapted to the disciple's specific mentality, and that's why it worked. But when you have a one to many relationship, you know, like uh, Rajneesh addressing thousands of people at once, it, it doesn't have the same impact. It's a curiosity, maybe. You know, a mental conundrum. But that's on the mental platform. That's on the psychological platform. That's for people who aren't really disciples. And I'll get to talk about disciples in the last part of this. But then there's gurus like J. Krishnamurti and also U.G. Krishnamurti who give mental puzzles. And then, you know, you're, you're left to solve them without any help. This to me is very uncompassionate. And finally, there are the, the really great realized gurus like Ramana Maharshi. But Ramana Maharshi was so disinterested and so completely satisfied by his own realization that in many ways he neglected to provide uh, guidelines for the management of his ashram in the future. Therefore, even while he was present, things started going off, and by now it's completely off the rails. And this has happened to every organization I've ever seen. Every spiritual organization, every sangha, every guru's a uh, temple or ashram or group has gone sour, sometimes violently so, immediately after their disappearance. So this has left me with a, a genuine distaste for organizations. What I mean, organization, after all, is simply an abstraction. It's not a real thing. It's just a name that we give when a bunch of people get together and decide to do something. <laughs> so, I'm not interested in creating organizations. But now let's talk about the disciple. 
The disciple should be someone in physical proximity to the guru. It's not that one can be at a distance and really be a disciple because one has to serve the guru, not just by sending money, you know, or something like that, but actually physically, directly serve the guru. There's something that happens that's very subtle, some chemistry that can only happen in physical proximity. And this has been in, in my ordinary relationships, like with my family and uh, partners in, in life. This has always been a problem because, of course, my energy has always been to go towards self-realization. And all the partners that I've been able to find, anyway, had some other interests. And this goes for my, my marriages and, and other kind of intimate relationships and even my so-called disciples in the past. They had some other idea of what to do instead of a real guru-disciple relationship. So things didn't work out and they didn't get the benefit. Now I feel like I have finally, after so many years, realized the actual purport of the Vedas. But it cannot be passed from, from me to anybody else just by words or just by explanations or teachings. Yeah, I'm going to continue making videos because that's what I do, you know. <laughs> that's my gig. But it will never give you the actual realization. That can only happen by physical proximity. Upanishad. Upanishad means come close and sit down. And the implication is to listen. But more than listening, one has to be in contact with the energy of the realized being. This is the crucial thing. This is the critical thing. So if one is far away, one can hear the words, one can see the form, but there's no direct contact of energy. If, in, if any at all, it's very, very dilute. So the real thing is to come close, physically close, uh -huh. and serve like a servant. My Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, taught me this, and he was able to pass his realization on to the many people who served him. But his teaching didn't go all the way. It didn't reach to the highest stage of Brahman. That's all right. Everybody teaches whatever they have realized themselves. But what I'm saying is, you have to be able to absorb the guru's energy. And that can only be done in close physical proximity. I'm sorry, I don't know of any other way to do it. There's no magical formula, you know, where I could zap people. <laughs> and even if it was possible, would it really be beneficial? Because you value what you work for. You value what you earn. You don't value what's just given to you. Look at how many people inherit money or win the lottery and then soon afterwards they're broke again. There's so many stories. Because they didn't earn that money. They didn't value it, so they squandered it. And I see many, many people who visit this site, who hear these videos, who come to our online courses, and they don't really learn anything. You know, they just go through the motions. And then they squander it. Why? Because it's free. They didn't have to pay for it. Huh? There's only one or two in the whole gang who have done the work and really earned the knowledge 
And so they actually got it. But what can I say? Unless one does the work, the knowledge won't be, it won't stick. Huh? So this is what I'm saying. I'm open to people approaching me directly, but they have to come here. They have to first go through all of the preliminary courses on our course site. Here's the link. And then they have to negotiate a way to approach me and associate with me on a daily basis. So I'm not going to uh, create a bunch of rules around this. Rather, I'm going to see what comes up and what we can negotiate. But this is really the kind of relationship I'm interested in having. Nothing else. And so if someone can take up this challenge, and I mean, this is a wonderful time in the history of the world to make spiritual advancement. So I've been looking forward to this time for a long time. If you can come and you can actually make yourself fully available, then you can get the full benefit of the full self-realization. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.